one of our teams found red-legged frog, which is very exciting because it is a red-listed endangered species in BC. What could be more iconic than our provincial tree, the western red cedar? Youth can identify up to 1,000 corporate logos, but can't even identify 10 species in their own backyard. Hi, I'm Candace Ng, and you're watching The Sustainable Region. Today, we're on the beach here at Belcara Regional Park, just one of many regional parks in Metro Vancouver's system. Why don't we start with a look at what Belcara has to offer. Welcome to Belcara Regional Park, meeting place of the Burrard Inlet and Indian Arm. This park has been a gathering place for three millennia. The Tsleil-Waututh First Nation built a village here in Belcara Bay where they fished, hunted and gathered mussels and clams during the cold winter months. This mound is a direct link to that past. It's made up of buried layers of shells, bones, discarded tools and the remains of homes. In more recent times, this same site was home to the Belcara Dance Hall until the 1960s. Today, people continue to gather at Belcara Regional Park. They come for crabbing and fishing, to share food at our reservable picnic shelters, to attend our community events and programs, to walk and hike the trails with views of mountain, marsh and sea, and for First Nations canoe and kayak adventures with Takaya Tours. There are buses that will take you from Port Moody right to Sassamat Lake's White Pine Beach and a stone's throw away from Belcara Picnic Area. There's also a bike path that goes right to Belcara Bay's picnic facilities. Both Belcara Picnic Area and White Pine Beach are wheelchair accessible. So bike, bus, boat or drive on down to Belcara and do what people have been doing here for over 3,000 years. Gather with family and friends. Hey. Hi there. Hey. <laughs> Looking for some fun this summer? Check out our Check It Out guide for a full listing of events, programs and other outdoor activities in our Metro Vancouver Regional Parks. You'll find activities for all ages. Spend a whimsical afternoon in the park at a Midsummer Fete. Or bring your furry family members to the fun-filled dog days of summer. Families can enjoy Minakata's Art in the Park Festival and also explore sea creatures at the Creatures of the Not-So-Deep event. Discover what our parks look like at night, at our Starry Night and All Night Stargazing events, or our Bat Watch programs. You can also get fit and healthy on our guided fresh air hikes, and Grannies, Gramps, Nannies, Mommies and Daddies Trek Club. Go to our website to find a full listing of events, programs and activities. There's something for everyone at Metro Vancouver Regional Parks. Check it out. Today, we're talking about the wealth of biodiversity in our parklands. The plants and animals that you might encounter, or the ones that are more elusive. There are literally hundreds, if not thousands of species in every regional park. But how do you know what they are? The answer is simple, identify them and count them. And that's exactly what happened at the recent Burnaby Lake BioBlitz. Water. It's one of the essentials for life on this planet. And on the weekend of the Burnaby Lake Regional Park BioBlitz, it fell from the sky in copious amounts. It was wet, but that's kind of normal for Vancouver. Sometimes it's sunny, sometimes it's wet. That's the way it goes. The Burnaby Lake Regional Park BioBlitz is part of a worldwide effort to monitor biodiversity. It relies on the volunteer hours put in by scientists to identify every living thing in a specific area. These researchers are on the hunt for bats. We've had volunteer scientists out over the full 24 hours, so some out last night and some out today, searching for basically everything alive they can find in the entire park. 
We're hoping that we'll see some beavers swimming past. Actually, there's one right there that just popped its head up as if on cue and is sticking its nose up in the air and smelling and wondering who are these people on the spit looking at me. <laughs> Organizers would have preferred better weather, but they say this weekend's rain pours from clouds that have a silver lining. The rain has been good because we've managed to get a lot of our migratory songbirds that we didn't get last year because it was so nice and gorgeous they'd already left for the Arctic and now they're hanging around going, oh my gosh, it's freezing cold, there's no way we're flying to the Arctic now. Lots of birds, but some other categories are missing entirely, like bees. There are 450 species in BC, but today the only ones visitors can see are these specimens. We came hoping to be able to see what kind of pollinators we have here in Burnaby. We expected to find several species of bumblebees and we might still if it gets warmer today and they actually start flying. But for now we're mostly just talking to the public about the great diversity of bees that we have in BC. You ready? Awesome! Let's go this way. <laughs> What the Biodiversity Blitz does is it helps people to understand the species diversity in their neighborhood, helps them appreciate the diversity of life, whether it's a bird or a plant or a fish or a bug. Talking to the public is a key element to any bio blitz. Oh, look at this one here. It looks so like it's a, a salmon of some kind. Yeah, oh, wow. it's a salmon. It's most oh, rare. whoa! Yeah. Cool. Okay, where should we put those? Whoa. I went out last night and set some minnow traps to see if we could catch any fish. And then came back this morning, pulled them out, and saw what we got. This guy right there and that guy are friends. They're in the same town. And then we put it on display for people to come by and check things out and see what's present in Burnaby Lake. See how it sort of moves like that? I just like this stuff, right? and people are here just because they get a kick out of it and they like showing people especially kids uh this is the sort of life that's all around them because bugs are really cool bugs are cool and that makes the twice daily bug hunt a big draw and you see this one look at how much wow. but bugs were also largely missing from this year's count as were most of the reptiles usually found in the park but there are some exciting finds too one of our teams found red-legged frog, which is very exciting because it is a red-listed endangered species in BC. And they got uh, five individuals they recorded. So that is a very, very exciting thing. And once again, a species we didn't have last year. We had lots of fish crews out on the lake. And one of their vines was they had a coho salmon as well as cutthroat trout. The size and age class of these fish means that there's actual resident populations of the cutthroat and that the coho are actively breeding in the lake, which is really, really great and it means the water quality in the lake is pretty good. Everyone that's come has left being happy. Our species count has definitely gone up and our surveyors are really happy with their results and findings. And it is exciting that the count keeps going up. Welcome back to the Sustainable Region and our look at the plants and animals that we share our parks with. Many of the animals that live here are what are called bioindicators. The state of their health indicates whether the environment they live in is in good shape or not. Frogs are a great example and learning about them is a terrific way to get kids excited about nature. Raise your hand. Frogs are awesome. Frogs Frog search event at Campbell Valley Regional Park begins with a solemn pledge. Treat frogs nice when you play, that's the Rivet Ranger way. Yay! <laughs> it's
It's a lighthearted approach with a serious message. Frogs are what's called a bioindicator because they are very sensitive to what's happening in the water they live in. The ponds in this park mirror what's happening in most ponds in BC. I know in general the BC frogs are starting to decline. Uh, a lot of it has to do with uh, the bullfrog. They really are just eating anything and anyone that gets in their way. American bullfrogs are an invasive species introduced decades ago with the idea of farming them for their meat. The farms flopped, but the frogs flourished. As with many frogs, they'll eat anything that they can fit into their mouth. So that includes other frogs, even ducklings. And there was a recorded case in Langley where a very large bullfrog actually tried to jump at a cat one day. These kids learn that it's important to gently put their dippings back in the same spot. This helps slow down the spread of this invasive amphibian. But these aggressive predators aren't the only bad guys in the frog world. We humans have also had an impact. You just have to stay still over this is it. a bullfrog. Frog skin is kind of like a sponge because they can drink and uh, water through their skin, but also they can breathe in oxygen through their skin as well. So usually if there is something wrong with the water, they'll be absorbing it straight away, and that's why they're usually the first ones to go. <laughs> if we're putting things into the water, that can have a devastating effect on them. So your guys' job is when you're doing this is to not make the pond really muddy. Does that sound good? Mm -hmm. Okay. Nonetheless, today's event has a positive message with a focus on getting kids excited about nature. With kids like this, it's so important to educate from an early age um, and just really to instill important environmental uh, values. Yeah, try the mouse. I think it's really important for them to actually just have a bit of fun while they're learning. So on their weekends, they actually get to get their hands dirty a little bit and learn while being beside the creek or the pond and really get to see what they're learning about in the classroom in a more hands-on way. Let's have a look. Oh, I see a fish. I see two fishes. We need to teach them how to respect the animals and to fall in love with them. It is something that needs to be ingrained as you're young, to respect that we're a part of something. We're not separate to ecosystems. We are a part of it. And we're responsible for a lot of it because we can make big impacts. And it's not a hard sell. Here you are with another world to explore and all you really need is a margarine container to go scooping up and to find that world. And our fish is still in there. So. Pond dipping is easily the most popular attraction here at Campbell Valley Regional Park for kids of all ages. I think that it's just the most wonderful thing to do because, you know, water, you can't go ever wrong with water. I, I think most children and adults like water. It's what's in the water, I think, that's so interesting. What's the mysteries under there? And what's yours to explore? Who knows what you'll find in there? Welcome back. Today, we're talking about the animals that live in our regional parks. But let's not forget about the plants. If you take a walk on a typical lower mainland trail, there are several common species that you'll see pretty much everywhere. As park interpreter Peter Lawrence shows us, you'll have fun getting to know them a bit better. Today we're at Catalano River Regional Park. Hi, I'm Peter Lawrence, Park Interpreter for Metro Vancouver. Did you know that 2011 is the International Year of the Forest? So that got me wondering, how well do people know what lives in our forests? Today I thought I'd introduce you to some trees and give you some pointers that you can use to impress your friends with your ability to identify some of the iconic plant life in our region. What could be more iconic than our provincial tree, the Western Red Cedar? There's lots of them here at Capilano River, and they're easy to identify. Look for their long, drooping branches, flat needles that look like fish scales, and they have a most wonderful aroma. You'll notice that cedar bark has a distinctively stringy texture, which is why many First Nations use it to weave clothing, baskets or rope, 
and the wood could be carved into poles, masks, and canoes. That brings us to another interesting fact about cedars. They're good for canoes or your back deck because they're resistant to rot. And that same rot resistance makes them perfect nurse logs. They're called nurse logs because as they decompose, they provide the perfect growing environment for other plants. If you find a small evergreen like this one growing out of a nurse log, it's probably a western hemlock. You'll recognize it from the drooping top. Even when it's a 150 foot giant, its top will still droop over. And although it shares the name with the poison drink that killed Socrates, this plant is not related at all. Lemony. This bark is a dead giveaway. Rough, creased bark with lots of furrows in it is sure to be a Douglas fir. And if you've ever bought a sheet of plywood, that's probably from a Douglas fir too, because they're noted for their strength. Now let's look down at what we call the understory. Sword fern is everywhere on the forest floor, and it's easy to identify. Each of the little leaflets looks like a tiny sword. On God. This leathery leaf plant is Salau, and if you don't recognize it from the forest floor, you may have seen it in a floral arrangement. Although it doesn't have any right now, it will grow clusters of white flowers that turn into dark purple edible berries. Here's another edible berry. Salmonberry blossoms are amongst the first to bloom in the spring, and they provide early food for hummingbirds and bumblebees. Later on, they develop into delicious berries. We haven't even mentioned any of the animals that live in the forest, but we're out of time and all of this talk about berries is making me hungry. So remember, wherever you live in the Lower Mainland, there's a regional park just waiting for you to discover. For Metro Vancouver, I'm Peter Lawrence. Daily life can be the same old, same old. But it doesn't have to be. This wildlife tree behind us? Discoveries are nearby. In the park programs of Metro Vancouver Regional Parks, informative, inspiring, rewarding. Dozens of park programs are scheduled all year in Metro Vancouver's 21 regional parks. Go to www.metrovancouver.org to find a regional park program near you. Welcome back to the Sustainable Region. We are here at the picnic grounds of Belcara Regional Park, a great place for families to just hang out and enjoy the great outdoors. And if you're very lucky, you might see one of the park's smaller residents, just humming along in its seemingly tireless search for food. Catching a glimpse of a hummingbird at a backyard feeder is a moment of rare beauty. Equally unique, a chance to learn about hummingbirds from a rare breed himself, a certified hummingbird bander. So here in BC, we have four species of hummingbirds. I was really fortunate and I was able to borrow three of the four species from the UBC Museum. So here you go. My name is Roy Teo. I work for Metro Vancouver Regional Parks and I'm a park interpreter. Um, and I'm also one of 200 people in the world certified to ban hummingbirds. Looks like cottonwood, doesn't it? Tonight's program is uh, it's, it's about hummingbirds and it's a hummingbird banding program and it's one of the programs that we've assembled in a series called the Hands-On Scientist. And I'm going to pass around a replica of an egg. This is an opportunity for us to bring in scientists and researchers who are qualified at things that are very specialized and things we often don't see. And who would have thought that there's people that actually have to be certified to go and band a hummingbird. We maintain a monitoring station out at Widgeon Marsh um, where we track the population, the abundance and the diversity of hummingbirds and that's been happening for five years now. All the work I do with um, banding and monitoring hummingbirds is out of passion and it's, uh, it's entirely volunteer. I've got it on, I'm just checking the fit. It rotates smoothly, that's good. It's estimated that 
overall, worldwide, um, there's about 6,500,000 rufous hummingbirds, so it's pretty healthy. But the concern right now is that there's been a steady decline of about 2.7% every year for the last 70 years or so. Banding hummingbirds allows scientists to track their population. On a recent July morning, 30 hummingbirds were banded, a normal number for this time of year. One of the reasons why hummingbirds are in decline is the loss of habitat. So anything you can do to enrich your backyards by planting native plants with flowers would help a hummingbird. Here in Metro Vancouver Regional Parks, we offer a whole range of programs that cater to the birder and the bird watcher. It was wonderful, all the information that we got on the birds. Uh, we certainly have our feeder out and take great pleasure in seeing them come and feed at our house. So uh, now I know a little more about it and just paying a little more attention to it. We had a picnic over yonder and then we came here. So it's been a complete evening. Bird watching is one of the number one recreational activities in North America. It gets people outside, they walk the trails, they get to enjoy nature in a passive way and just listen to the wondrous sounds we have around us. I love hummingbirds. When I lived somewhere else, we had one of those basic hummingbird feeders and we had hummingbirds all the time. I think that's when I first fell in love with them. I think they're so awesome. We've got a feeder just outside the kitchen window where I stand when I'm washing the dishes. It's right there and I can watch them from very close. They're gorgeous, they're fantastic flyers and really interesting birds. I'm, I'm absolutely amazed by hummingbirds. The greatest things, having one up, uh, up close and in my hand. Um, even now I'm amazed by how small they are. Looking for some fun this summer? Then check out our Check It Out guide for Metro Vancouver Regional Parks programs. You'll find activities for all ages. We have events, fun for families, evenings of exploration, and health and wellness programs. Go to our website to find a full list of events, programs, and activities. There's something for everyone at Metro Vancouver Regional Parks. Check it out. Hummingbirds aren't the only elusive birds in our parks. Raptors are also good at keeping to themselves, especially owls. Now you can see nesting barn owls at Campbell Valley Regional Park anytime you want. The installation of wildlife cameras was part of a recent event celebrating the connection between young people and nature. An historic barn at Campbell Valley Regional Park was the scene of two simultaneous events. the unveiling of new wildlife cameras in the park and the launch of a national contest aimed at getting young people and, interested uh, in nature. So that's a wonderful publication. And if you enter the contest, you might also get your entry in this beautiful calendar. Did you know that youth in North America can identify up to 1,000 corporate logos but can't even identify 10 species in their own backyard? That statistic is one of the reasons why Robert Bateman, a wildlife artist, decided to start the Bateman Get to Know program. And one of the main initiatives of this program is the Canadian Wildlife Federation Bateman Get to Know Art Calendar Contest, which invites youth across Canada to get outside, get to know their wild neighbours and create artwork based on their experience. These kids from Surrey were among many young people invited to the twin launch. Their day began with a dip in the pond and their faces say it all. Hello, little tadpole. Nature can be just as fascinating as what's on TV, maybe even more. And this is a young insect, and it's going to change a lot. And so why is it important to connect youth with nature? Well, a lot of research in the last 10, 15 years has shown that uh, the earlier you can connect kids with nature and the whole concept of environmental health, the better off we are down the road because there's, with them, less incidence of childhood obesity and learning disabilities. It's actually essential to connect children with nature because many of our species are endangered 
And so that's why it's really important to get children outside, exploring their own backyards, exploring their neighborhoods, finding out all the species that live near them, and uh, really get them engaged in conserving wildlife and habitat for all the future generations. The new wildlife cameras are also aimed at sparking excitement about nature. They'll transmit a streaming video of a barn owl's nest here at Campbell Valley Regional Park. Those will be live transmitted where you get to see the details of how they lay and incubate their eggs and how they hatch and raise the young. So it's a kind of opportunity to see the live action of the wildlife as it's maturing. Students from Robert Bateman Secondary and Abbotsford, who also attended the event, got to see the real live action, thanks to a demonstration by Orphan Wildlife Rescue, also known as OWL. So Sarah is known as an education bird at OWL. She's of course a barn owl. Meeting Sarah is a picture-perfect moment, but for most of us, our best chance at seeing an owl close up is online. You can watch all the owl action at metrovancouver.org. And don't forget, owls are nocturnal, so you'll see the most action after dark. Information about the calendar contest is available at gettoknow.ca. Thanks for taking the time to learn about the plants and animals that we share our parks with. We hope that on your next visit to a regional park that you'll feel more connected to the living creatures that call that park home. Let us know what you think about today's show or pass along some story ideas. We'd love to hear from you. Call us at 604-436-6794 or email sustainableregion at metrovancouver.org. For the Sustainable Region, I'm Candace Singh. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.